How are you feeling? Good morning. <laughs> Sometimes it's nice to have a test in the past, because then it's not your problem anymore. You don't have to worry about it. It's my, no, it's my problem. I have to mark the thing. So it's my, my to-do list. Uh, so I wanted to actually just show this Mastering Physics homework six question. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember this one. This was due on October 30th. 84% uh, of you answered it. Of those people who answered it, 96.3% of you got it correct. So that was really, really good. And I'm really, really glad that that went well. Um, and then there's this quote, I guess I got this morning on the pre-class seven comments from a student. The test is the reason why homework should not only be finished, but understood. And I guess I'll draw this uh, pie chart to your attention here. This is the, the marking scheme in the course syllabus. And which is kind of weird because you know, you spend an hour and a half in each of these midterm tests, so there's three hours, and this is a two hour final, so like this is five hours of your life, right? Whereas, you know, each mastering physics homework takes probably three hours to do, and there's 10 of those, so it's like 30 hours to do in, in there. So, you know, I'm just pointing out here that the, the whole purpose of all these tiny little slices of pie is for you to learn. That is what I want. I want you to learn and to understand the physics, and that is why I give all these fairly easy to get marks for the, for the uh, mastering physics stuff. So that's just all, you know, food for thought on a, on a Wednesday morning. Somebody asked me to go over the uh, question one, let's, let's do it. <laughs> question one from this morning, if you, if you did it. At any angular speed, a certain uniform solid sphere of diameter D has half as much rotational kinetic energy as a certain uniform thin-walled hollow sphere of the same diameter. So the way I'm picturing this is I've got the solid sphere, okay, and it's rotating, and I've got this hollow thing over here, okay? So maybe this is one and this is two, and it's also rotating. And what's the same about these things is that they have the same omega and also the same radius, r. Okay? And so, but for a solid, we know from our, uh, our table that I put up last class, which is I1 is equal to 2 fifths, that number would be you know, on the front, of the front of the test or something, of m r squared. And for a hollow sphere, it said I2 is equal to 2 thirds. So these are things that are given to you. And then this one, we'll call it M2. This one was, uh, if the mass of the solid sphere is M, it's asking to uh, find M2, I think. And so the way I did it, if we have some room over here, is we know that uh, K rotational is equal to I times, sorry, one half times I omega squared. That was one of our equations. So let's, and we know that K1 is equal to half of K2. So I can say one half I1 omega squared equals one half I2 omega squared. Sort of all over the place here. Uh, but it's the same omega squared on both sides, so we can cross those out, cross out the halves. Oops. Oh, sorry, there's an over two, right? And so I get that uh, two fifths of m times r squared is equal to a half of two thirds m two r squared. That's where we're going with all this. The same r squared on both sides. Again, things cancel. And then solving out for m2, I get that uh, 2 over 5 of m is equal to 1 third of m2. So m2 is equal to, I think it's 6 fifths 
of M. Okay. Oops. Okay. Just using that uh, rotational kinetic energy, which I'm going to introduce today. Uh, a lot of today, I want to spend talking about this concept of rolling without slipping, which is a bit of a weird one. And let's start with this picture. And I'm going to tell you, whether you believe it or not, see that really, really fast car? Right now, that car, let's say it's going 200 kilometers an hour. It's really cooking along. But there are four points in that car that are, that are at rest. You know where? <laughs> It's the bottoms of all four tires, no matter how fast it's going. And one of the ways I try to explain this, a few different ways of explaining it, is think about a tank. If that was rolling along, what it's doing is it's, it's going this way, is it's kind of laying down tread at the front and then picking up the tread at the back. But the bottom, that tread part, I have so many wires. It's Ridiculous. Sorry, video people on YouTube. As it's rolling along, that bottom, bottom part of the tread right here, I don't know, you can imagine there might be little spikes or something that are going into the ground. So they're not moving relative to the ground as the tank is going across, because the spikes go right into the ground. Do you believe me? And I'm saying that for the tank, it's the same thing for the car. The car is laying down tread of the, of the tire and then picking it up as it goes along. So I want to send something to your learning catalytics. There's two questions I want to talk about. And it's a very simple situation, but I'm going to overanalyze it like I normally do. <laughs> so you're sitting in your car. Maybe you're at a stoplight. The light turns green. So you step on the gas pedal, and the car goes. So let's analyze the heck out of this situation. <laughs> all right, so first of all, your car is changing its momentum. It's speeding up, it's accelerating. So there must be an external net force on the car from something else in the universe. So, like F1 on two. One is something else and two is the car. And remember, by Newton's third law, there's going to be an equal and opposite force of the car on whatever that thingy is. I think it's one of these five things. Can you choose? Are you seeing it? I'll give you a minute to think about that and tell your neighbor what you think. So yeah, so it has to be an, in, an external thing to the car in order to add momentum to the car and accelerate the car. So the engine's inside the car, so it can't be the engine. Uh, air could be. It can't be the gas pedal. And I don't think that there's invisible string on the front of your car. So it's either the air or the earth, but it turns out it's the earth. Okay. It's not the air. Now, there are cars that could work this way. You could have a giant fan on top of your car. Like sometimes you see those boats that go around in the swamps or or hovercrafts or something like that, they have a great big fan, and then it is the air is the external um, object. But let's do another one. Second question, same situation as the first, but now a different question. Okay, so we know it's the Earth. So here's a list, a giant list, of all the different forces that you've learned about in this course so far, right? Uh, so which one is, is it? It's one of these. I'll give you a minute. What does the survey say here, actually? Oh. I'm gonna find it. Uh, wow, so you guys are pretty good. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, it's actually static friction. So, um, and I, the way I think of it is that if you were on a horizontal flat surface that's completely icy and you stepped on the gas, your wheels would just spin around and you would, your car would not accelerate. The external force on your car is coming from static friction, and that's, that's also what, causes me to accelerate if I run, right? I run like this. It's the static friction on the bottom of my shoes from the floor, which is causing me to go forward. So, well done. 
All right, so now the next thing I want to try to do is talk about uh, how this works. And I'm going to use that piece of tape right there and think about the two different ways it can move. So we've spent most of this course talking about translation, where something moves along. And now we have rotation, where that's you know sort of positive rotation or negative rotation, something can rotate. And rolling without slipping is just adding the vectors of these two types of motion. So we can draw it out. Uh, let's talk first about uh, translation. So let's draw my circle. Like that. And there this one doesn't have an axle, but it might have an axle in the middle. If it's moving along, you could maybe draw different points. This one's moving with some speed v. This point's moving with some same speed v. And this one's moving with some same speed v. So those, if you think about those three points, or any point really, they're all moving at the same speed. And then let's just think about rotation alone. So the same object now. But now we're going to say it's, it's rotating and we'll have it actually rotating like that. So um, this point up here now is moving maybe this way with Vt, which remember was equal to omega times r. And every point has got a tangential uh, velocity. The, the center right here, this axle, is V equals zero. It's just sitting there. And the bottom point is moving, since it's, this one is clockwise rotation, it's actually moving to the left with Vt equals omega times r. So what we're going to do is we're just going to add, these are actually all vectors. I should have drawn little vector signs on all these. So we can add the vectors, these three vectors. So let's add to have something that is both translating and rotating. And what we're going to do is we're going to have this, um, the trick is, the trick, or the constraint, is set uh, v equals to uh, vt. This v over here equals vt, which is omega times r. If you do that, then what you get is the top point is now going v plus v, it's going 2. 2 uh, vt. Okay. And then the middle point is v plus 0, and so this one is going at just vt. And then the bottom point, well, now you have equal and opposite vectors, and so the bottom point is v equals 0. That's how that works. And then all the other points that I haven't mentioned are going at some weird diagonal. Like I guess maybe you could look at this point over here. Uh, that would be going, it's still got a V and then plus a V down. So it would be some sort of weird diagonal where this is like root 2 of Vt or something. But anyway, we can do it with the actual um, Uh, piece of tape. So what I'll do is I'll put a little ruler on there, if you can see it, and I'll start it right here at zero and roll it along. It goes like this, rolling, rolling, rolling. That's half a roll until it gets to one complete rotation. It ends up at here. Okay. So that was one rolling. And what, how far do you think it went? It went the circumference in one complete roll from here to here. And so if you think of the V of rolling, whatever it is, it's going to be equal to the circumference divided by um, the period. So it's 2 pi r divided by t. 
And another way of looking at that is rearranging this, it's 2 pi over t times r. And I don't know if anyone remembers what this is called. It's not w. I'm waiting for someone to shout it. What? I didn't hear. Oh, yeah, anyway, it's omega. So it's omega times r. OK. Didn't wait long enough. So rolling without slipping kind of looks like this. And I've, this one, I've sort of drawn the tire part of the car kind of flattened a little bit, but just to remind you of the tank, I guess. The bottom's not moving. Under normal driving conditions, the portion of the rolling wheel that contacts the surface is stationary, not sliding. Whether you believe it or not, it's definitely true. If it was sliding, you would know it because you would, you would hear this big screeching sound, right? And, and also, if you've just got kinetic friction, it can only go opposite the direction you're going. And so you wouldn't be able to steer, you'd probably end up in the ditch. Static friction can go any direction, that's why it's the most useful form of friction when you're driving, if you want to control your car. V is circumference divided by the period. So we can, and that's actually how your speedometer works, is that um, it knows the circumference of your tires. So the onboard computer can just um, measure how many rotations per second your tires are doing, and then it can compute your speed. So what I'm trying to imagine showing here is something like here's the road, it goes around one whole time, and this is your 0 0.9 meters. Then it goes around one whole other time, this is another 0 0.9 meters. And it, it just counts those. And so the frequency, which is 1 over period, is equal to 10 um, rotations per second. And, uh, you know, so the T here is equal to 0 0.1 seconds. And so V being the circumference divided by the period is 0 0.9 meters divided by 0 0.1 seconds, so it's 9 meters per second. And then it can convert that to kilometers per hour and show it on your speedometer. And that's why if, for example, the effective circumference of your tire decreases because you, you know, have less air pressure in your tires and you're down a little further, your speedometer won't be exactly correct. And so if you're looking at the difference between your GPS and your phone speed, and the speed you actually see on your speedometer, the GPS in your phone is using those satellites and actually trying to find out how far on the Earth you moved. It's usually actually more accurate than, than your onboard computer. So they're thinking of changing speedometers to, to use GPS. But. Okay. And then when you, this was the equation we just wrote down before, which was this V of rolling without slipping is omega times R. Super useful equation. Also, how far you travel is the theta, how much that object rotates times r. And also, the acceleration of the object is equal to the angular acceleration of the rolling object times r. All you do is times it by r. So what I call these are the constraints. So I guess the constraints of rolling without slipping, I, I'm just repeating the title here. But the point being that if you're doing a problem and you know that something is rolling without slipping and you've run out of equations and you can't solve for the unknown, then you can, if these are on your age sheet, you can say, haha, I know it's rolling without slipping. I could use any of these three equations as well. And maybe that'll help me get the answer. You can sub in. Usually you're trying to eliminate omega or, or alpha. I can give you some examples of when that works for you. And then the other thing I want to remind you of, so now we know about that. This is just to remind you about the rotational kinetic energy equation, which we've gone through a few times. It's uh, 1 half i omega squared. So what happens if something is both rolling or both rotating and moving translationally is you just add the two kinds of energy. You have, that was this plus this. So you have one half mv squared of the translation plus the one half omega squared of 
the rotation equals the total energy of the rolling without slipping. Because if you were to stop it all of a sudden, you would have to stop the V and stop the omega. So they just both add up. I'll give you an example of that. Example. A 0.5 kilogram basketball is rolling along the ground at one meter per second. What is its energy? So let's just draw it. There's the basketball. It's going along. Um, so we'll say V is equal to 1.0 meters per second. M is equal to 0.5 kilograms. It's weird because it didn't give the radius of the basketball, but let's just see what happens. Maybe it cancels out. The kinetic energy is the K translational plus the K rotational. And I'm going to use the fact that it's kind of like a hollow sphere, so because it's just got air inside it, that I is equal to 2 thirds mass times r squared. Don't know what r is, so I'll put question mark. I'm wondering if that's a problem or not. And then I'm also going to use a rolling without slipping constraint. The important one here being I've got v so I can find omega. It was that v is equal to omega times r, which means also that omega is equal to V divided by R. So if I write down the kinetic energy, it's one half M times V squared plus one half I times omega squared. So now what I can do, so my blue pen just to remind me what my next step is, I'm going to take the I from up here and go and put it in right there. And I'm going to take the omega from here and and put it in there and see what I get. So I want to get rid of the omega and I want to get rid of the i. And see what cancels. So it's one half mv squared, I'm not doing anything to that, plus one half of two thirds mr squared times v over r all squared. So I have to, uh, it's um, one half mv squared, it's not quite right here. Yeah, a half times two thirds, you times this in and you get two over six of m times r squared times v squared over r squared. Oh yay, look, the r is canceled. <laughs> so the fact that they didn't give you an r is not gonna be a problem. And then it's one half mv squared plus 2, 6, mv squared. So it's 3 over 6 plus 2 over 6, all times mv squared. So the kinetic energy is, is 5, 6. And we have m and we have v. So it's 5, 6 of 0 0.5 kilograms times 1, all squared. And on my calculator, which I don't have because I gave it to somebody at the test last night. <laughs> so I did it in Excel. Uh, it's 0.42. Okay, so that's an example of using the rolling without slipping constraint in the middle of an equation or in the middle of a problem. I pulled this out of almost seemingly nowhere. It came off my aid sheet because I know that the basketball is rolling without slipping. I was on the, um, was a question this morning, question three, want to look at that? Consider a uniform solid sphere of radius r and mass m rolling without slipping. Which form of its kinetic energy is larger, translational or rotational? So it's the same sort of thing. I'm going to use that the solid sphere is I is equal to, uh, it's two, what is it? 
Two fifths? Now I'm forgetting. <laughs> oh, what was it? Got the wrong thing written down here. Who remembers? Something. Is it two thirds? Um, just yell at me if I'm wrong. Anyway, the point is that K translational is equal to one half mv squared, and k rotational is equal to one half i, which you get from up there, times omega squared. So it's going to be one half of, if I'm right about the solid sphere, two thirds mr squared times omega is just v over r, because rolling without slipping, all squared. The r's cancel, and you end up with uh, again, 2 over 6, right? mv squared. And that is less than, than a half. A third is less than a half. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to our analogy page, just to kind of take a look at where we are. So back in linear or uh, linear or translational motion, we had position, velocity, acceleration. When you're talking about rotational analogy, you got theta, omega, and alpha. The translational cause of the acceleration is the force. The rotational cause of the angular acceleration is torque. The thing that resists translational acceleration is called your mass. The thing that resists rotational acceleration or angular acceleration is called rotational inertia. So that's, that's where these two equations come from. And now you've got kinetic energy, where you've just sub substituted in, instead of m, you've got i, and instead of v, you've got omega. So let's actually list some different forms of, of energy that you could put in your conservation of energy uh, equation. Uh, there's good old one half mv squared. It's translation if the center of mass is moving along. You've got gravitational potential energy, mgh. You've got spring potential energy, the one half kx squared, where k is the uh, spring constant. Now you've got, if it's rotating, you've got uh, rotational kinetic energy. There's thermal energy, which is usually the work that was done by kinetic friction. The, the uh, force times distance of the kinetic friction. So an object can possess all of the above. And I know you can imagine maybe a, a potato that is going up a hill and it's rotating and sliding and attached to a spring. Well, it's got all of the, <laughs> these things. I don't know. And work can be added to the system or taken out of the system if you have uh, an external force. Okay. We're ready to do this demonstration. This is a picture of it, but we're gonna actually do it, and I'm going to ask you to predict the answer. Okay. So it is a learning catalyst, I think it's question three, actually. Um, we're going to take a solid disk and a hoop. And these both happen to be the same mass. It's written on here somewhere. But these are uh, both 677.6 .6 grams. Because the disk is made of wood and the hoop is made of metal. And they both happen to have the same diameter. So I'm going to start them at the uh, starting line and let them race down. So I'm going to see which one wins. And then Kevin's going to go catch it from over there. So let's just give you a little bit to predict. Think about it. What's the little inset? Oh, the finish line. I love it. <laughs> so at the end, you'll be able to see which goes over. Kevin's got a whole amazing. <laughs> it's 
from the forests of southern Ontario, you have disc made of wood, very smooth. And from Sudbury, made of nickel, you have hoop. Both will, will roll without slipping. Who will win? Only you know. Okay, vote. <laughs> All right, let's vote. Well, I'm not going to stop the delivery because it'll show the result. Well, let's stop. Okay, we went once, going twice. Stop. I think it's a stop. And let's try it. I'm going to put the hoop in front. It marks. Get set. Go. <gasps> Wood wins. Okay. <laughs> the disc wins. Interesting. The disc wins. So back to that slide. It says nature is not a democracy, so it's definitely disc wins. Disc always wins. But we're going to try to think about why does the disc win. And I'm not going to tell you till the final, the end, I guess. Maybe when we, there's a few different ways of thinking about it, but we're going to calculate it. Do you want to do another one? Let's imagine a different kind of situation in which you have a solid disc versus a box. You think maybe the box would not even go at all, but the box is frictionless. Which wins? So we don't, we're not going to do this demonstration because I don't have a frictionless box. But uh, so this is a thought experiment. And I think the thing I want you to think about is if you're rolling without slipping, is there friction? And if so, what direction is the friction in? in? So this was fairly split, um, but 48% of you voted that the box wins. And that is what I believe. So two ways of thinking about this. First of all, I mentioned friction and asked you the question, is there friction in rolling without slipping? Yes, it's called static friction. And it can act in any direction, as it turns out. So in the case of the disc rolling without slipping down the incline, it's accelerating, which means that it is rotating clockwise like that. So, and its angular acceleration must be clockwise. So the torque on it must be clockwise, and that's from the static friction. So which way is the, is the torque from the, of the static friction on the bottom? I think it's up the hill. So the static friction is up the hill, so it's going to slow it down. Another way of looking at it, which was pointed out by this guy in the front row, which is a good one, you start off with all your energy in MGH, because it's not moving. And then at the end, with the disc, it has to share whatever it lost in UG into partly the translational kinetic energy. I put K lin, but I mean, you know, translational, linear, I guess, um, plus K rotational. Whereas with this one, the same amount of energy is lost when it gets to the bottom, but it can go all into uh, the translational. And so this has, is going faster because this is the 1 half mv squared, and this is the 1 half mv squared. It's got had to share between 1 half mv squared and the 1 half i omega squared. Does that make sense? This question? Yeah. So if the first uh, incline was frictionless, what would happen to this? Then it won't. So the question is, if the, if the top incline was frictionless, what would happen? Well, it wouldn't rotate. It would just slide without rolling. Slip without rolling or something. <laughs> It would just be a, a circle, which would just, it wouldn't want to rotate. You would release it from rest, it would just slide all the way down. Can you imagine? The only reason it rotates is because it's getting stuck to the wood and it's got some torque from the static friction which is causing it to rotate. It's a great question. Okay, we're going to do another race. And this time I have, as your contestants, do, 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 do. We have cream of mushroom soup versus chicken broth. What is the same? Well, they got about the same mass, okay? They also are about the same shape, okay?
okay? However, what is different? Cream of mushroom soup is a thick paste. So shake it around. You can hear that thick, gooey cream of mushroom soup in there. It's sticking to the inside of the can. However, chicken broth. I don't know if you can hear it. Okay, it's, uh, it's definitely like water, okay? It's just, it's low viscosity just sloshing around in there. Who will win? Oh, I have to deliver. <laughs> so, it's a learning catalytics question. Please make a prediction. And then we'll do it. <laughs> Who will win? <laughs> I'm gonna leave the voting open actually. Let's just do the race. So I've got chicken on the front versus mushroom on the back. On your marks, get set, go. Boom! The chicken wins. Chicken always wins, by the way. <laughs> Which one is it? Okay. And this is how I picture this one. It's a bit weird. <laughs> Cream of mushroom soup is like the solid disc. And the chicken is kind of like what you imagined before. Something frictionless. The chicken broth does not need to rotate. It can just kind of go down. Because it's not sticking to the edges of the can. Can you imagine it? Maybe it does slosh around a little bit, but the, the cream of mushroom soup is stuck to the edges, so it must pick up all that rotational kinetic, uh, kinetic energy. And the, the chicken broth is much more like a, uh, a frictionless thing. Okay, the rest is, is, is math. I want to go through and actually derive how you get these actual answers. It's not that hard. Well, it's, it's got an extended free body diagram, so maybe it is. First of all, let's do the, the box on an incline. Use this one. What's the acceleration of a slipping object down a ramp? You should know how to do this one, right? This one you should be able to do in your sleep. Do, 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 do. You can do it while you're humming a, um, a jolly little tune. <laughs> Mg is down, normal force is up, friction is zero. Uh, define our axes. <laughs> Let's put the tilt the axes, y down that way, x down this way. So da -da 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 -da, we're going to have to um, decompose the gravity because it's on a diagonal. There's your theta in there. So I would say that uh, sine of theta is equal to the uh, mg in the x direction, which is the opposite, divided by mg, which is the hypotenuse. So this F net in the x direction is equal to the only x component thing is the mg in the x direction, which is mg sine theta. So that's m times the acceleration is equal to uh, mg sine theta. M's cancel, and you get your answer. Acceleration is, is g sine theta. So we're going to try to remember that, g sine theta, and see how the other things compare. Because the next question is going to be, what is the acceleration of a solid disk rolling down the ramp of incline theta? Ready? I'm go like this. So here's question two. Uh, so now, we can draw it again. But now you have to draw a circle. And imagine what's happening here. Here's your theta. We're going to again define uh, y to be the, in the direction of normal, x to be down the hill. And I'm going to also define counterclockwise as positive rotation. It's good to write that down somewhere. And I'm going to draw the extended free body diagram of the object. So what are the forces on it? Well, we've got mg acting down on the center of mass. We've got over here 
static friction acting up the hill and normal force acting um, perpendicular to the hill. Right? And N and F sub S oops, are the unknowns. I don't know if you guys know this, should know that uh, the three things that you can never just write down an equation for are normal force, tension, and static friction. Those ones you have to just find by looking at, you know, balancing your forces and all that. So I'm going to also define the rotation axis to be the center of um, the disk. You don't have to do it that way. A lot of people define the rotation axis to be the point where it touches the, the ground, but either way will work. In this case, the torque due to the normal force equals zero because the normal force acts toward the center. Make sense? And if you act, it's like trying to rotate the door by pushing right towards the hinge. Won't, won't rotate it. Also, the torque due to gravity is equal to zero because it acts right at the, the rotation. Mg acts at the center. And that's this rule that the purpose of the center of mass is that when you're computing torques, the gravitational torque acts as if there's a little hook pulling it right at the center of mass. So in the case of a disk, it's pulling at the center. And if you have defined the rotation axis to be the center, then there's no gravitational torque. So there's only one thing that can do torque on this disk. It's the last force. What force is it? What force causes a torque on this extended object? Why is it rotating as opposed to sliding along? Static friction. Very good. It's negative Fs times R is the torque due to the static friction. And also, we're going to use to do a rolling without slipping constraint. I don't like the alpha there. Which is that alpha is equal to A divided by R. And so I can plug this into here. And I can get that the negative Fs times R, the negative comes from the fact that it's clockwise, is equal to I times alpha over R. So I can solve for the static friction is equal to negative of I times A divided by R squared, where A is the, that acceleration. And just moving this along a little bit, I can say that um, F net in the x direction is equal to mg sine theta, that's the gravity component, minus the uh, F sub Fs, which is up the hill. And that's going to be equal to m times a. So a is equal to g sine theta, just divide both sides by m, minus i times a divided by m r squared. I'm just going to solve for A. And I get, collect like terms of A over on one side, 1 plus I over M R squared equals G sine theta. So the A here is equal to G sine theta divided by 1 plus whatever the rotational inertia is divided by M R squared. Okay, so that's a nice equation. And in our case of the solid disk, you get um, I is equal to a half mR squared. And so A is equal to um, G sine theta divided by 1 plus a half mR squared divided by mR squared. It's equal to G sine theta divided by one plus a half. So it ends up being three halves. So you get A is equal to two thirds of G sine theta. And that is less than G sine theta for the blocks. That is why 
the box wins. Because it's going down with G sine theta, whoops. And the solid disk is going down with uh, two thirds sine theta. Check my time here. And basically another thing that you can note from here is that the bigger the rotational inertia is, the slower it's going to go. If the highest you can get is hoop, which will be 1 plus 1, then you'll have a half of g sine theta. If you look at this little i right here, i is on the bottom, so bigger rotational inertia object for the same mass will roll down slower without slipping. I right, will post those. Um, coming back on Monday, please read chapter 11 or, and or watch this pre-class video. And something to think about, we're talking about uh, a figure skater. Figure skater starts with her arms outstretched and rotating and then brings her arms in and her omega increases. So why is that? And have a great weekend and I'll see you Monday.